all the people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're expecting more recruits in here. We're off to a good start. And this is a great crowd. Brother Glenn Griffith said there were times that he had eight people. But they were always a great crowd. And we have a great crowd here today, too. We're, we are certainly appreciative of having our evangelist uh, team here uh, tonight, uh, Brother and Sister Bolus, and uh, Brother Jeremy Fuller and his wife. Um, you'll get acquainted with them. And, and uh, also the, the Shrouds, we appreciate so much their being able to be with us. And uh, let's be friendly and get acquainted with them and uh, welcome them into our midst. And uh, we've already told them if there's any need or anything they need to let us know. And uh, we certainly want them to be uh, welcome uh, here in the Midwest. Praise the Lord. We, are you expecting God to do some great things for us? I do believe, I do believe that with the opposition of the devil everywhere, and it's not just in our church. I mean, it's everywhere. Everywhere we turn, fellow ministers are telling us of unusual things that are happening. But to me, uh, that's a good sign that the old boy knows his time is limited. And the Lord wants to give us a great camp meeting. We had a fantastic youth camp with wonderful results and, and young people seeking God and getting uh, sanctified holy. I heard testimonies last night of those that were wonderfully and gloriously sanctified, just as clear as they could be. So we thank the Lord for that. Well, let's enter right in as Brother Shroud comes to lead us in the singing. I'd like for Brother Don Nichols, if you would, come to the platform, please. The Lord bless you. Well, if you can find a praise and worship hymnal close by, let's turn to hymn number 128. Number 128. We're going to start with the chorus. It is our privilege to be here. And we trust the Lord will help us this week. We're here on business for Him. And we trust God will help us together. And if we haven't met you before, make sure you come up and, and say hello to us and introduce yourself. And I hope that the Lord will help us over the next week and a half here that we can accomplish something for the glory of God. Amen. Let's sing this beautiful, beautiful hymn together. I shall know him, I shall know.
our Redeemer throughout eternity, it just causes all of our hearts to speed up just a little bit. Some time ago, I, I read the book, Heaven is for Real. It's been popular around and scoffed at by uh, a lot of media people and atheists, but uh, it just blessed my heart as uh, 
the little boy shared about his experience in meeting the Lord. And uh, one of these days, if, if uh, we're ready, we're all going to have that opportunity. Praise his name. We're looking to the Lord in prayer tonight. I would encourage you, if you have prayer requests, uh, you want everybody to hear, to leave them on the pulpit desk here or uh, see Brother Sutherland and uh, give prayer requests. But we do have some of our uh, pastor's wives and our conference president's wife that needs prayer tonight. Uh, Sister Sutherland had a recent surgery and is recovering from a back surgery. And uh, Sister Mary Raines fell and broke her arm. And Sister Mary Harris uh, fell and broke her arm. And if your name is Mary, be careful, <laughs> especially if you're a pastor's wife. Uh, seems like there's a trend there. And uh, then there are many who are traveling in for camp. And so let's pray that God's protective hand will rest upon those uh, pilgrims and strangers who are gathering across uh, the Midwest to meet here the next several days. Let's thank God for bringing our evangelists in safely and uh, pray that God will settle down and, and meet with us in a special way during this encampment. I don't know of a time in my ministerial life, and I've been trying to pastor for a long time now, when I feel like we need a mighty move of God across our movement any more than we do now. Sons and daughters and grandchildren need to see the glory of God in a new and fresh way. Uh, and uh, some of us old timers need refired and refueled. Uh, our vision cleared. Uh, let's pray for Israel tonight. If you're following events in that part of the world, you realize that enemies are surrounding her. But uh, God is her friend. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but when I listen to uh, their uh, president, premier, whatever they call Benjamin Netanyahu, speaking and going back to the historical uh, roots and uh, since 1948 when God established that and brought them back in just like he promised, uh, I'm convinced that he's going to finish it out just as he promised. But a lot of suffering involved for a lot of people. So let's pray for that nation tonight and for the peace of Jerusalem. Maybe there are unspoken requests tonight that you would like to designate with the uplifted hand. Why don't we stand together for prayer? If you prefer to kneel, I know some of you can't kneel on the concrete. But let's uh, humble ourselves before the Lord tonight and seek his face and ask his blessing upon our encampment. Dear loving Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you for bringing us once again to this place. We thank you for your wonderful presence in the youth camp and the notable and wonderful victories around this altar already this week. We wish that all the young people would have been able to stay and be in this service and the services to come. But we realize many of them are from non-Christian families and, and are not able to stay. And they're going back to face the same world from which they came uh, this time during youth camp and had a reprieve from uh, their sinful surroundings. And I just pray that you'll be with each one of them tonight and make them strong in you and, and help them, dear Father, in the days ahead uh, to get established and, and to be pillars of the churches where they attend. We thank you, Father, for this camp meeting and for bringing our evangelists safely. And we pray thee tonight that thou wilt use them for the glory of God. Set them in a large room, as the psalmist said, we pray. And give them a divine enablement tonight. Oh, our Father, uh, make preaching effective. May the singing of the songs of Zion minister to the hearts and lives of each of us tonight. We pray for these, Lord, that Satan seems to have attacked and ask that you be with Sister Mary Rains and, and be with Sister Evans tonight and her eye condition and, and uh, Sister Harris and Sister Sutherland, Lord. You know all of these whose uh, uh, bodies have been attacked and we just pray that you will touch them for the glory of God and help them to be in the encampment we ask. 
Bless, dear Father, every part of this service tonight. Uh, undertake for all of the unspoken requests. You know, uh, young people and uh, grandchildren and sons and daughters are out of the ark of safety tonight. Uh, spouses, I pray that somehow the Holy Ghost uh, will do a work during this encampment. Uh, oh, God, that will usher many into the kingdom. Uh, sanctify these moments to our good and to your great glory, we ask. Uh, and for all that you do, we'll give you praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. thing that makes camp meeting important. You ought to be way up the mountain uh, by the end of the, uh, the camp time. I know we may be weary and tired, but it's amazing how we come into the presence of God 
And in just a little bit, God has a way of rejuvenating us and making us come alive and uh, not, not feel the things that made us tired in the first place. So good to see each of you here tonight. We thank the Lord for his faithfulness. Do we have ushers here tonight, by the way? Have we already got that? Okay, all right, let's get that. Let's come ahead, fellas. And uh, we'll just, um, you remember what uh, Brother Gray used to say? Uh, you can quote it by heart. Where two or three pilgrims are gathered together, let an offering be taken. <laughs> he taught us good. <laughs> let's give us unto the Lord. And uh, I know that he, he's going he's gonna to bless and help us. Father, we thank you so much for giving traveling mercies to those of us that are already here. We thank you for the presence of God we sensed in the wonderful song that was sung as well as the congregational singing. And we ask you, our Father, that thou would uh, touch our hearts and also help us, Lord, as we, as we come up under the load for financially for camp. I know you've been faithful over the years to supply every need. Bless your people uh, spiritually, physically, and financially, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. that say amen. amen amen we are privileged we are privileged uh, to be in the house of God and to I just want to thank the Lord for people like the shrouds that have given their talent to God and uh, you can feel that anointing touch and we really appreciate it by the way brother shroud is the the music director or head of the music department at Penview and uh, we certainly are appreciative of having them with us Brother Jeremy, our evangelist, um, he um, traveled for Penview for some time. And uh, I know at Clinton Camp, uh, Sister Judy Williams wasn't able to be there. And, and some of the board uh, said to us that, uh, well, let's have Jeremy Fuller. And I said, I don't know Jeremy Fuller. And, uh, but I got to know him and was very pleased with uh, his ministry uh, there. Uh, kind of, I guess, came up under um, Brother Jim Plank and was at the school and traveled with the school for some time. And uh, you're going to get acquainted with him here in just a few minutes. But it's also good, and this year is very unique. I said, you know, I just feel like that uh, I'd like to have a young guy uh, with passion and fire to stir the hearts of the young people. And then uh, 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 
I started to say an old guy, but anyway, Dr. Bolus, Brother Bolus, come up here. <laughs> I tell you, I love this old guy. <laughs> Amen. Give us a word of testimony, if you would, please. Well, I don't know. I feel feeble now. I might need some help to stand up here. <laughs> I've heard a lot about the Midwest Pilgrims and their camp. My, of course, my brother-in-law and sister are part of you, Jack and Ruth Hart. Yeah. And uh, she talked with me today and said they're going to be here Monday. But since 1959, December 22nd, when I gave my heart to Jesus, I've never been the same. I don't want to be the same. And I love the Lord with all of my heart. We've built a romance over 50 years of walking with Jesus Christ. It isn't fictitious. It isn't imaginary. But he is a God that I live with day in and day out. Someone that meets my needs. Someone that lets me approach him day and night. And I've learned through the storms and through the trials that Jesus Christ is forever the same. And I love him tonight, and I'm looking forward to being here these 10 days or how many days they are. When you get my age, you can't remember days. So, But we're trusting the Lord to help us. I would appreciate your prayers. I, um, it seems like the devil knows how just to afflict my body at the time when I don't want afflicted. Of course, I never really do, but I'd rather have it sometimes than others. But my throat, and I just have, I'm on antibiotics, and I just I feel like I've swallowed a razor blade, and I'm trying to swallow around it. And but the Lord's able to touch, and I'm I'm trusting Him for that. We're going to get acquainted with our workers, and uh, I love brother and sister Sutherland. They're dear friends of ours, and I trust this, these will be days when we'll sense God, the Holy Ghost, just falling in on us. Uh, and renewing us and helping us till we'll never ever be the same or forget these days that we've been together. God bless you. Make yourself acquainted with me because I want to meet you and I trust that God will help our spirits to blend together. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Bolas. I want to make just a, a couple of announcements um, as we enter into the meeting tonight. Uh, number one, um, there is a private wedding reception in the kitchen and dining hall. Uh, so don't go putting your nose against the glass and looking at wedding cakes. Uh, let's just uh, don't wander in there. That's a, it's a private situation, and it has nothing to do with us. So we want to honor them by staying away, okay? And then the Education Examining Board will be meeting back here in the back of the tabernacle in the morning at 8 o'clock. So, brethren, you that are involved in that, uh, please uh, let's be on time and, and to get our business taken care of. Um, again, we're, we're certainly appreciative of the workers that we have. Well, by the way, I better mention uh, the schedule for in the morning. Rising Bell is going to be at 6 o'clock in the morning. And prayer time will be here in the tabernacle at 6.30. And then our, our first meal will be served at 7. And uh, there will be no children's service tomorrow, but the preaching service will be at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning. And uh, Brother Bolus will be doing the speaking. And then, of course, noon hour for, uh, on our Saturday schedule will be dinner. And uh, preaching service at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and Brother Fuller will be preaching. And then, of course, supper time at 4. Inspiration services start to, tomorrow evening. Um, Brother Nichols will be in charge of that. And then evangelistic service at 6.30. So let's remember those things. We'll talk about some of the rules maybe a little bit later, and most of us know about them anyway. Let's just be respectful of the property and mindful of each other's uh, presence and uh, honor our brothers and sisters by um, going to bed when we're supposed to and and uh, not agitating your neighbor. That's good preaching. Amen. Uh, again, good to have our team with us, uh, Brother and Sister Shroud. And then, if I get this right, I think it's Maria? Mariah. Okay, I didn't have an H in this place. Okay, and Emily? 
and Lauren. We'll want to get acquainted with them, and I'll forget it by the time I get from here to there. But uh, we're sure glad to have the family uh, with us. And also certainly glad to have um, um, Sister Fuller with us. Uh, it, Sister Fuller, you want to stand so people know who you are. Give us a word of testimony, if you will. God bless you. Yes. Amen. Amen. They have three precious little children that are just thrilling the hearts of some grandparents while they're here. They're back in Pennsylvania, I believe. But uh, anyway, we're, we're grateful for these folks being here. Brother Jeremy, will, you'll be hearing from him in just a, a little bit. Again, the Shrouds are going to sing for us, after which Brother Jeremy Fuller will give us what God's laid on his heart. Confess my sins to Jesus, and He sweetly took me in. I just started, and I kept going. Then He sanctified and filled me with the Spirit deep within. I'm glad I started. may test me I trust in amazing grace I'm glad I started and I'll keep going for the battle's almost over and soon I'll leave this place so glad I started Your eyes on the Savior. Just a few more days to labor, then we'll sit down beside the river. How we long to be with Jesus and our loved ones gone before us. There's a better day a coming. We're not home yet. among the chosen few so glad I started and I kept going we'll rise through the clouds of glory with those who have stayed true so glad I started and I kept going Just a few more days to labor, then we'll sit down beside the river. How we long to be with Jesus, and our loved ones gone before us. There's a better day coming, we're not home yet. For I'll keep going till I enter sit down by the river neath a tree of life with loved ones who have bravely kept the faith and in hand we'll stroll together with our lord on streets of glory i'm glad i started and i'll keep going i'm glad i started Glad I started, and I'll keep going.
Hallelujah. Aren't you glad tonight you're on your way? Praise the Lord. We started on our way about 3.30 this morning. That's when we got up anyway and uh, got on, on a plane about 6 o'clock, 6.20, took off down the runway and into Washington, Dulles, and then on from there to Indianapolis. And it's good to be here. I told Brother Sutherland back numbers of months ago when he asked me to come to this camp meeting, I said, Brother Sutherland, I cannot preach with Dr. Bob Bolas. Now, I'd never heard Brother Bolas preach, but I'd seen his picture. And I figured anybody with a doctorate and white hair like that, there's no way I could preach with him. But I'm going to do my very best. The Lord's been talking to me about that. And uh, he said, let no man despise thy youth. And some of you are wondering, just how old are you anyway? I asked a lady that some time ago, and she said, well, probably about 21. I said, well, if you keep saying that, and I just keep getting a little older, and you're just always about 11 or 12 years under, that'll be all right. I was born in 1979, so that makes me 32 tonight. I am grateful for the Lord's goodness and mercy and blessing, His faithfulness, and what a privilege to be with you this evening. Thank you, Brother Sutherland, and all the board who was responsible for extending this invitation. And all I can say is please pray that God will hide me behind the cross and give me the help that I so keenly am sensing I need tonight. About a week and a half ago, I felt the Lord, in a very plain way, begin to press on me the truth that... Even into this afternoon, I have, without a doubt, felt that there, this is the message for this service tonight. In fact, I did not know for sure when I would preach first until I got on the grounds, but uh, assumed that possibly I would be preaching tonight. But just feel clear, so clear, that this is the message for this service tonight. I do thank the Lord for Brother and Sister Shrout. We know each other quite well. Brother Shrout and I were roommates for a year at Penview. Traveled together for a year in a male quartet, and I appreciate their lives, have utmost confidence in them, and uh, it's good to see familiar faces. Trust that the Lord will bless us together. Let's stand as we take God's Word. Turn to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter number 33. The book of Exodus, chapter number 33, for the reading of the Scripture tonight and for prayer. I want to begin our reading tonight at verse number 7. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, far off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be shown, known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the, the people that are upon the face of the earth? The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, 
will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, here is a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with mine hand while I pass by and I will take away mine hand. Thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Verse number 18 is our text tonight. Moses' prayer for the glory. Moses' prayer for the glory. Let us pray. Father, we are keenly aware tonight that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against darkness and against principalities and against rulers. Lord, we ask tonight to be hid behind the cross. We ask that somehow this message will ring our bells, that somehow we'll be stirred to action. That, Lord, though we know this truth and though we love this truth, that once again we'll be called by the indwelling Spirit to do something about the possibility of seeing God's glory anew and afresh in our midst. Come, Lord, anoint Thy servant, wash me in the blood, make me an instrument that God can easily use. For Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. January 15, 1919 was a warm day for a Boston winter. Almost shirt sleeve weather. This is the north end of the city, Commercial Street, Atlantic Avenue. It's almost noon. The, wi the byways bustle with Model T's and delivery trucks. Horse-drawn wagons clatter over the cobblestones. Strollers are coatless, hatless, and thinking of spring. Not the slightest warning of what is about to happen. Suddenly an awesome sound is heard everywhere. A terrible rumbling like a thousand machine guns said one ear witness. In moments disaster, one of the city's greatest ever, North Boston is about to be engulfed by a tidal wave. The torrent tears at everything in its path. Loaded freight cars are tossed like matchboxes. One freight car is rammed right through the wall of the railroad terminal. A group of city workers are eating lunch at a public works yard, drowned where they sat. Three more workers in several houses are swept into the basement of a freight terminal, all dead in just seconds. The tidal wave reaches the Boston Fire Station. The whole building is lifted from its foundations and battered against the harbor wharf pilings. Firemen are crushed and drowned. Beams of wood and sheets of steel are hurled through the air. A fearsome cyclone of energy is unleashed, inundating everything. A team of horses is slammed through a fence. A 69-year-old woman is catapulted through a window of her home. Like the terror-struck inhabitants of ancient Pompeii fleeing the wrath of this voice, men, women, children trying to escape, all dashing on foot, driving horse carriage and automobiles. But the onrushing tidal wave swallows them instead. North Boston became a living hell that day of gasping prayers and ear-shattering screams. In just minutes, it's all over. A section of the Boston Elevated Railway is reduced to twisted, dangling steel. Buildings are devastated, strewn about the landscape. Naked foundations, those not submerged, yawn in the sunlight. Horse carcasses litter the ravaged avenues and people too. Dozens dead, hundreds injured. We're only minutes before workers labored, strollers shopped, children played. It's now all a scene of unfathomable ruin. January 15, 1919. Rescue operations began immediately. They are tedious. They are stomach-turning. This event makes nationwide headlines, eclipsing even those of revolution-wracked Russia and the Paris Peace Conference. In the nine-plus decades since, we have made great strides and have seen much advancement in disaster detection. Before the hurricane hits or the earth itself cracks open, we can tell. Sometimes. But sometimes things are still entirely unpredictable. Certainly no one in North Boston could have foretold what happened 92 years ago. The explosion at the Purity Distilling Company which resulted in a tidal wave 
of 2,300,000 pounds or gallons rather of molasses. That's right. Not water from the East Atlantic Ocean, but molasses. Who would have guessed? Who would have thought? I thought about that story tonight in relationship to our text. Relationship to the glory of God. I don't know what your expectations are for this camp meeting, but ladies and gentlemen, we need to have our expectations raised tonight. And if you came with low expectations, then you need to experience the unexpected because we need desperately a tidal wave of God's glory moving across our midst throughout this camp meeting this evening. This verse, this text before us tonight is a beautiful prayer. It's a prayer that all of us should be praying throughout this first weekend of this camp meeting. It's a prayer for a personal manifestation of God's glory. Notice that, no, that Moses did not pray that the people could see God's glory. He didn't say, Lord, show the people thy glory. He said, Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Oh, God, help us tonight that we get hungry and thirsty and desirous of a personal revelation and manifestation of God's glory. This is the crying need of our hour. This is the need of my conference. This is the need of your conference. This is the need of our movement. It's a fresh touch of Almighty God in that supernatural something that passes by. I was thinking this afternoon, just how do you define God's glory? How can you put it in words? And I was thinking this afternoon as I was praying and meditating on this thought and this message tonight. I don't know how I would present this message to a nominal crowd. Because it's difficult to explain just what the glory of God is. Most of the time it's not something you can see. Visibly like the cloud that came down on top of the mountain until the fire, until the fire was very present and the people of God were afraid because they didn't understand what was happening. But oh, tonight, though I may not be able to define it better than that supernatural something that comes sweeping through, I can tell you that from a child I've seen and I've experienced and I've tasted the glory of God. And 32 years later tonight, I'm still hungering and thirsting for this one thing and that's for a fresh touch of God's glory on my own heart and my own soul tonight. I remember the very first time that I got a glimpse of God's glory. It was in the old Pleasant Valley Brethren in Christ Church where I grew up. Uh, that little white chapel that sat nestled down against the mountain uh, down through Pleasant Valley. I'll never forget I was probably six or seven years of age. Uh, and God's glory moved into that revival meeting that night. Uh, and uh, actually it was a Sunday morning. Uh, and my uncle, my uncle Ed, my dad's younger brother... Oh, he would get blessed and he would run the aisles and he would shout. Oh, it sent chills up and down my spine. He would say, it's wonderful. And oh, he would jump and shout and run. I'll never forget that Sunday morning God moved in. And I don't know exactly how it happened. But somehow he got me and my three brothers. And we all got outside the church. And we were running around the outside of the building. He was in the spirit. We were out of the spirit. But I'll never forget the impression that it made on my heart. And I thought as a child, if I ever get religion, I want the kind that my uncle got. Because I could see and I could know and I could feel it was real. God was alive. God was real. And God was making a difference in the lives of those that I was in association with. This is a message that denominations and conferences just like the pilgrims and just like the God's missionary church and across our movement, I could name them tonight. We need to be reminded of the fact that Moses first believed in the glory of God. He believed in it. He had a conviction that there was something that God had that he needed and he was hungry for it and thirsting for it. In fact, if you want an outline tonight, the first part, the first point of the outline will simply be this. And that is regarding Moses' prayer for the glory. This was a prayer. 
This was a prayer motivated by discontentment. This was a prayer motivated by discontentment. I don't know exactly what that verse means uh, that I read to you tonight when the Bible says uh, that Moses spoke face to face with God uh, as a friend. Because other parts in God's Word, I find uh, that no man can see God's face. Uh, no man can look on God's face and actually survive. Uh, and so I have to use uh, a little bit of sanctified common sense uh, and assume uh, that what God meant uh, when the inspired penman wrote that text uh, was that Moses uh, had communication with God so intense uh, and so personal, though he didn't actually look on God's face, it was like looking on God's face uh, because it was so real. And I believe I'm safe to assume tonight that Moses had more personal fellowship and more intimate communion with God perhaps than any other man that has donned a, a pair of sandals. Uh, Moses, uh, God said about Moses, He said, when there's a man of God among you, He said, if I want to communicate with him, uh, He said, I'll show him a vision uh, or I'll show him a dream. But Aaron and Miriam, how could you think? Uh, how could you dare think uh, 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 and, and, and get lofty in your thoughts about yourself? Uh, God came down struck Miriam with leprosy and said, uh, but Moses, it's not so with Moses. When I want to talk with Moses, I'll speak to him as, as a friend face to face. And yet, in spite of all of that personal communion, those wonderful prayer times, yet, yet there was some sort of holy discontentment that was welling up within Moses' heart until he prayed this prayer, Lord, show me thy glory! It's not enough that you promise us your presence. It's not enough that you've given us all of these wonderful deliverances out of Egypt. But Lord, here we are, just on the other side of the golden calf, just on the other side of the terrible, terrible stain of idolatry on their history. He said, God, you've got to do something special for us. You've got to show us thy glory. Just a couple of months ago, a dear man of God by the name of Dr. Ray Hughes died. I don't know if anybody here in this crowd would know that name. He was a Pentecostal brother from the state of Kansas. I believe he was his denominational leader. He was president of the Bible school in their denomination. And I don't know much about him. But a couple of weeks ago, I had a dear pastor friend, one of my spiritual allies, a good holiness preacher, send me little YouTube clip on an email that I could watch part of a sermon that he delivered back in the 70s at the Kansas State Convention Center. And I listened to the first nine, ten minutes of that message and I ended up watching or listening to my computer every single phase of that message because it made me hungry for God. Oh, it was anointed. He said, well, it was preached by a man who believed in speaking in tongues. I don't know what the dear brother believed altogether, but I know that God was given him precious, precious anointing and he was delivering a message of truth from this very text and he was warning his denomination that there's three things that can steal the glory of God out of our midst. They are first, institutionalism, and second, formalism, and third, materialism. That man could have preached that message on the platform of IH Convention or any one of our camp meetings or in any one of our holiness churches uh, in spite of the difference and a little bit of a theological disagreement uh, on the matter of speaking in tongues. Uh, but you know what? Tonight, uh, that dear brother has lived uh, and died uh, and his denomination uh, has drifted so far tonight uh, that they would never probably stand for a message uh, delivered in one of their conventions like that tonight. And it's a stark reminder to you and to me tonight that drift begins, drift begins when we stop believing in the possibility of experiencing God's glory in our midst. I want to ask you tonight, and I'm not expecting a verbal response, but I want to ask you tonight a stirring question, a staggering question. I hope you'll be honest with yourself. How long has it been since God Almighty has stepped down in the pilgrim camp and swept across these chairs and across these mourners' benches and blazed from this pulpit and stirred our hearts and brought us to tears and brought converts and sinners from this camp meeting or sinners to the camp meeting and made them converts. 
sanctified, holy, and called preachers uh, and, and straightened out lives uh, and refreshed and refined the pastors and their wives and the lay people. Oh God, show us your glory tonight. It'll never happen the next 10 days. We'll just get comfortable and we'll just ease through and be satisfied with a form of godliness but deny the power thereof unless tonight, the very first night of camp meeting, we ask God to send us some holy discontentment until we'll say, God, I've enjoyed the prayer times. I've been enjoying talking with you face to face as with a friend. But there's still a yearning and a burning in my heart that causes me to pray with Moses. Lord, I beseech Thee, show me Thy glory. I never forget, I never forget in 2007, the beginning of the, I guess it was maybe the middle of the year, maybe June or so, and I was able to buy my very first brand new truck. Now, I don't know if you've ever been able to do that, but... Uh, I just had that opportunity one time. I don't think I'll ever do it again because I'm still paying for it. I guess it'll get paid for this year. It's a business vehicle, so I needed it. But I had, for numbers of years, struggled along with a 1987 Dodge Dakota. One of those two-tone beige and brown jobs, you know. And I mean, everything in that truck was worn out. Absolutely everything. The seat is so worn out that you sit way down here and you're holding the steering wheel up here and you're trying to see out over the front bumper. The rattle trap doesn't have a gas cover on the gas tank, you know, there, the gas lid. It's just missing and there's, there's just parts and pieces missing all over. And I remember when I got that brand new 2007 2006, it was, a, it was a leftover, I bought it in 2007, it was a leftover at 60 miles and I pulled off the lot with those dull wheels, that fine interior, and you sit up here like you own the road. I'll tell you what, anytime our boys have to go out and we need both trucks, I find one of the other guys to, die, to drive the Dodge. I, I own both of them and I write the checks and I'm not interested in driving the Dodge. I'm going to drive the Chevy up here. Gross vehicle weight, 12,500, and down the road we go. I became discontent with that old Dodge. In fact, at this point, at this point it won't pass inspection. And the man tells me the best thing you can do with this truck is take it in for scrap. Actually, right now I've got it loaded down with 2B stone about, about a ton, and i got a jack underneath it because before I put the jack underneath it, the muffler was about that far from the ground. I think I'm going to listen to that mechanic. I'm going to get rid of that old rattle trap. But I'll tell you what, there's something far more serious tonight about being discontent about. We ought to be discontent with barren alders. We ought to be discontent with the fact that our churches won far too few souls last year. We ought to be discontent that there aren't more and it isn't better. There ought to always be a pressing toward the mark, towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh God, help us tonight. Baptize us anew and afresh uh, with a holy discontentment uh, until we'll pray with Moses. Uh, Lord, show me thy glory. When I turn back to Exodus chapter 24, I think I begin to understand this prayer a little better. Because in Exodus chapter 24, we read that, that uh, Moses had a real taste of God's glory. I want to pick up at verse 15. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Forgot about his breakfast, 
in his suppers, in his snacks. He just was in God's glory. And he was so content to be there and so enjoying the glory of God, the presence of God. He just stayed there 40 days and 40 nights. You know, if, if we can just get a taste as young people early on of the glory. I don't understand it tonight. I'll just be honest right up front with you tonight. I don't understand it how some have gone out from among us a lesser way. Abandoned the standards that the Scriptures teach and just throw caution to the wind and go out and settle for a cheap, superficial entertainment that simply does not draw That's what the church is in danger in every generation of doing. Trading the real thing for something that's substitutionary. Something that's superficial. Getting satisfied with just going through the motions. Having a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof. I owe your, your churches, one of your churches specifically tonight, a great debt. Because it was in one of your churches up in the state of Michigan, numbers of years ago, on a choir tour of Penview, that I got a taste of God's glory. It marked me. Brother Shrout was in that service, Sister Shrout was in that service, my wife was in that service. There's something about that service I need to tell you. That was a Monday night. It was a Monday night. The, the group, had, I believe, had left Penn's Creek on Friday and had driven through the day out here to Ohio or somewhere for a service and going to have services right through the weekend and right into IH Convention like all the Bible colleges do. But we went up to, to Michigan on Monday night. But before I tell you about that service, I need to talk to you about Friday night because on Friday night, as I got into, into the service, into the parking lot of the church, the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit was on the bus and He tapped me on the shoulder and said, Son, I, I don't want you to go eat tonight. I want you to get your suit on and get in the church by yourself and don't draw any attention to yourself. Just slip aside and just seek me. It was difficult. I was hungry. But I obeyed the Lord and you know, Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night, everybody in that choir got blessed but me. I remember some of those services. And I just stood there on the choir risers and thought, Lord, I guess they must have fasted too because <laughs> the Lord's blessing them. And I don't know, maybe I need to fast some more, but I don't feel anything. But you know, that Monday night, God... And that service up in Lansing, Michigan, moved down on that congregation. A place was packed. Brother and Sister Lyme were there. I don't know where they're at now, but Brother and Sister Lyme were up there working with all those children and all of those young people. I'll never forget that service as long as I live. It marked me. We were down the, in the uh, basement of that church. I remember God settled down on the young people. We were praying and seeking God. I remember having my forehead down on the carpeted concrete floor, begging God to do something for us. Really not even knowing what I'm, I was asking for Him to do, but just to come and melt hearts and get souls to Jesus. All weekend long, I had this still small voice somewhere saying, get off the choir risers. And that's not a part of our repertoire. And all week long, I just pushed that little voice aside. But by Monday night, after four services, that voice was so strong, I knew it was God. The Scripture says, test the spirits, try them, see if they be of God. I got to the place in my heart and in my mind where I believed that if I didn't get off the choir risers, choir risers I would be disobeying God. I, I, I felt like I'd be grieving God. Didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I remember the choir, the, the choir had sung the first song in that second half of that service. The quartet got down to sing. God was blessing and God was helping and the presence of the Lord was there. By the end of that song, I knew I needed to obey God and I got down off the choir risers. 
Young lady up in the choir, she began to testify. One of those little popcorn testimonies, just blessed of the Lord. Give me time enough to get out in front of the choir. Had no idea what I was going to say, Brother Bolus. Had no, no understanding of what God was wanting to do. But I looked at those young people. My heart was turning within me. So I looked at their condition and just imagined the backgrounds and the situations that they were coming from. And it said something like this. Some of you have no idea what's going on here tonight. But I want to tell you how Jesus saved me from my sins. And that's all I really remember after that. God took over. I'll never forget it. It just come right down, hit me right here. I always heard people say that. I'd never experienced it before that moment. But it, I, out over that altar and down through that that aisle jumping and leaping and God moved on that service that night and coming around this way and that way and this way and young people started coming to the, to the altar. And I'll never forget, I got to the back of the sanctuary after a couple of times around that, that church and started back towards the, towards the front of the sanctuary. Got up here about the front row. And the Lord just laid me down. Didn't hurt. There I was laying on my face on the carpeted floor of the church. Maybe about five, six, seven, ten seconds. We used to call that being slain in the Spirit. We, we don't see too much of that anymore, do we? I wonder why. I, I know there's no premium on specific manifestations of the Spirit. It really doesn't matter how He comes as long as He comes. I tell you, I, I just want to be a part of something that's so marked of God. The young people filled in around that mourner's bench. You know, we weren't able to finish our repertoire that night. Just had to set that aside. Just all across the front and all through here. Young people and parents and people just seeking God and praying and crying and weeping. I don't have time to tell you too many stories tonight. Brother Sutherland said that I come up under Jim Plank, and that's true. But I never did learn to preach just 30 minutes. I'm not sure how he does that. But let me tell you about a, a service up in the state of New York. Another pilgrim church, just a small little chapel. Never forget that five, six days of meeting. And all through that week. I drove my wife crazy because I wouldn't spend too much time. I was praying. It's all right. It's all right, wives, to feel that way when your husband's just so preoccupied that you know, you're a little frustrated because he's, he's just so heavenly minded. He's no earthly good. You know what I'm talking about. But I just had this, this utter sense of helplessness to do anything for those precious people. And so by the hour, I walked those city blocks and I begged God, somehow you've got to help us, God. And you know, not a lot happened Monday through Saturday night, but Sunday morning rolled around and God began to help the preacher. Never forget the pastor of that church, he said, we got a family coming in this morning, said his wife just committed suicide, he's got three children, going to be here in the service this morning. Those children were so unchurched and so unruly, they just about destroyed the service. The poor man was so embarrassed, he just didn't want to stay. He grabbed their coach, you know, got up on the edge of his seat, didn't want to make a, a big show, and you could tell he was embarrassed, but he didn't know what to do. The children were running around. But brother, God was helping me preach, and it just seemed like I could see there was a battle going on. That that dear man was just about to get out and to leave and not to stay for the invitation. And I just kept preaching and kept preaching. And God kept pouring on the preach and I just kept preaching. And I could see he was just itching towards the front of his seat. And he just really wanted to leave. And he was looking at the children. And they were behind him in this seat and this way and that way and causing a distraction. And I kept preaching and I kept just thinking, God, you've got to help us. You've got to help us. Here's a precious soul. You know, I never premeditated this. Never had happened before. But I was over here on the right side of the sanctuary and down here and preaching away. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, to my utter surprise, I was walking the backs of the pews. 
right to the back, just to preach it. Well, you know, when I got to the back of the sanctuary and got down on the floor, people just run to the altar. They just run to the altar. God's presence so instantaneously swept over that little pilgrim hole in His chapel that I didn't need to give too much of an altar call. God, God had done His work. You know, that man, he had never seen anything like that in all his life. I walked right past him just to preach. He was really confused now. And he really wanted to leave, but he couldn't. I had a congregation stand for prayer, and, the, and the, the people were praying, and there was a sense of God, and there were people weeping at the mourner's bench. And i never forget, man, he was looking around and wondering what to do, and the dear, dear old Christian, white-haired Christian gentleman sitting right across the aisle, he just slipped right over and touched him on the arm and said, Would you like to go pray? He said he sure would. He come up and got down and started praying. And brother, oh, I jumped in around behind him and I was pounding the altar and pounding the floor and praying and God was helping and God was blessing. I just prayed until it felt clear that he'd gotten clear through. And he looked up and I looked at him. And I said, what did God do for you? He said, hot dog! <laughs> he didn't know what to say or what he had experienced. But God was there. The glory of God settled down. Something supernatural passed by. Amen. We don't have a lot of money, do we? We don't have a lot of fine, fine buildings we can call our own and put our names on them. But that's not what's important. If we ever trade this, we've missed it. We don't have anything else to offer. Our young people aren't children tonight. We owe it to them, to the next generation, uh, to pray with Moses. Uh, Lord, I beseech Thee, show me Thy glory. Amen. Let me tonight. This prayer was a prayer prayed by Moses. It was a prayer motivated by discontentment. I'm so sorry. I'm not used to having one of these types. And I'll do my very best to try to be sensitive. I know it must be terribly distracting to have that scraping like that. Please forgive me. Moses prayed a prayer motivated by discontentment. But he also prayed a prayer manifest with desperation. That little word beseech in the Hebrew, I'm sure Brother Bolus could do a much better job of exegeting and clarifying the meaning of that Hebrew word. But it's there to denote a strong and intense desire. He said, I beseech thee. I don't know how to say it any stronger, God. You've got to show me your glory. You know, this, this kind of reminds me of my dog at 3.30 this morning. It's a true story, and I remember it very well. My wife and I didn't get to bed last night to about midnight, going in 1 o'clock. We knew that the alarm was set for 4 and at 3.30 this morning, Levi, our big 85-pound yellow Labrador retriever, started barking in the backyard. Now, we just got back from our own youth camp. A friend of ours was feeding the dog, and I was trying to ignore the barking at 3.30 this morning. And my wife finally said, Isn't anybody feeding the dog? Aren't you going to take care of the dog? So I got out of bed. She said, where are you going? I said, take care of the dog. I got my slippers on. I had to get down through the basement and over next door to be able to get to the dog food because that's where we have it stored so the neighbor guy can get the food for the dog. Back through the basement and up through with some feed thinking the dog's hungry. Our friend hasn't been taking care of him properly. So I got out in the yard. I found his little dish put it out there where he could get it. I knew he was going to attack me. So happy to see me at 3.30 in the morning in my slippers. And he did. He didn't disappoint me a bit. But instantaneously I realized after I dumped the feet, the feet in, the, in the bowl that it wasn't, it wasn't food that he needed. 
In our fence, in our fence line, we got some fence, it's actually the neighbor's fence, there's bamboo. Bamboo that's growing all up along the fence line. And through those dog days of summer, Levi just he jumps up and he grabs that bamboo and he'll pull it down and he'll pull it this way and this way, trying to break it off so he has something to play with. And somehow Levi got his chain all twisted up in that bamboo until his 20-foot, 15-foot chain was shortened up to about five or six feet. And he was scared to death. His freedom was gone. He was scared. And so I put my the thing I had brought the feet out with, and I grabbed him around the snout because I didn't want him slobbering all over me. And I got his chain, his snap, and I was going to take it off. And when I took it off, thinking that I'd get it unwrapped and I'd hook him back up, I had a hold of his collar. And the moment he heard that snap click free, he <laughs> and took me with him. <laughs> Literally. I have the marks on both legs to show it. My slippers were gone. We had lots of rain last night in Pennsylvania. And down through the yard at 3.30 this morning, Levi was headed for the house. Now, I'm not real heavy, as you can see. About 140, 150 pounds. Levi's about 85 pounds. He's a big dog. But he's just a dragging me down through the yard. But I had a grip. I mean, I wasn't letting go of him. And he, I was just saying to myself, you better hope. You better hope that when we get stopped, that I'm sanctified. Because <laughs> I was hurting. I got him tied back up. Got him untwisted and so forth and so on. And he didn't bark anymore through the night, or through the morning, rather. He was scared, and he was desperate. You know, when I read this chapter of God's Word, I see that. Moses was scared. He said, God, if you're not going to go with us, don't you carry us anywhere. If your presence is going with us, don't carry us up hence. These are your people. I can't do all this. That's what I hear in this chapter. Moses was scared. He was frustrated. He felt like he was carrying a burden that was way too big for him. And it was. And it's too big for us too. There was also that desperation. And I guess they haven't come up with a word in the English language that can combine those two ideas. Desperation and fear. But if there is a word, tell me what it is after the service and I'll use it next time in my outline. But that's what we have here. And I thought, oh, how fitting. Every one of us tonight, especially the pastors and the pastor's wives and the lay leaders that are carrying the burden in the local congregation, there ought to be a fear of letting God's glory be missing from the scene of action. Well, it's our responsibility to pray it down and to fast it down, and to do whatever is necessary to obey God so that when we come into this tabernacle from service to service, uh, there's going to be a radiant smile. There's going to be a joy bell turning somewhere. There's going to be a song. There's going to be some, some uh, holy joy and some unspeakable glory. There's going to be God uh, having the opportunity to move on us and to work on us uh, just in any way that He wants to. And it really doesn't matter if there's no walk in the backs of the pews or, or jumping up on tops of the pulpits or whatever. That does, that does, that's not what's important. But what is important is to absolutely know, like Moses' prayer, and I'm hastening to a conclusion, that this prayer was manifest with desperation, but it was also marked by deity. It was marked by a divine response. God said, Moses, there is a place by me and I will set thee on a rock he said my glory is going to pass by he said when it passes by I'm just going to put you in the cliff of the rock and I'm going to cover, my, cover you with my hand I'll tell you if there's ever a time where we need a place by God it's tonight in 2011 
when the economic foundations of our nation are crumbling, when the moral foundations of our nation are crumbling. We've just lived through the most horrible three weeks of political scandal, moral scandal coming out of the House of Representatives. It's an embarrassment to God. It's an embarrassment to this nation. It's an embarrassment and a shame to decent folk everywhere. The, the economic and the moral and the social foundations and even the religious foundations of, of scattered across this nation tonight are churches that, that at one time believed in the glory of God. They Across the denominational barriers, uh, they believed and they preached uh, and they experienced the glory of God. But the majority of them tonight uh, have sold out to institutionalism uh, and formalism uh, and materialism uh, and it's robbed the glory of God out of their midst. Uh, and tonight, uh, there's yet a movement uh, and I believe I'm a part of it and all I'm asking God God raise up some young people and raise up some older folk tonight in this camp meeting this week that will get a hold of God and say I will not let thee go till thou dost bless me show me thy glory again anew and afresh until when the lights are turned out and the last offerings taken and the last prayers prayed and the last Mourner has sought that around these benches. Uh, we'll know this camp meeting was marked by God. He passed by. He came and honored the preaching of His Word. Uh, he always honors truth. God's people responding and being obedient were being channels through which God can move. Uh, and sinners were made hungry and believers uh, saw their need for cleansing and we all moved up the road. Hallelujah. I'm glad tonight that this prayer that Moses prayed, that it was a privileged individual, that this prayer is not confined to just to Moses, that any one of us tonight that will have our hearts stirred can pray this prayer. We can, we can allow God to help us to be motivated by discontentment. We can ask God tonight to help us to let this desperation be manifest that this prayer would be answered and that this prayer would be marked with a divine response and that this camp meeting would be what God wants it to be. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not going to give any sort of altar call tonight at all, but I would like for you to come, Brother Shroud, if you would. I'd like for us to stand together. I'd like for Brother Shroud to lead us in that course. I'm contending for the glory of God in our midst and I want us to sing it one or two times. Just search our hearts. Give God a few moments to, to speak to us about the message and about the truth that was given from God's Word. And maybe even in these moments, maybe even in these moments, there will be vows that need to be renewed. There will be promises that need to be quickened to our hearts that God will perhaps be reminding us of some things. It always takes preparation. The glory never comes until there's preparation. Preparation is so key. Read through the Old Testament and again and again and again in beautiful poetry. The prophets talked about the way being prepared so that the glory of the Lord could be revealed. Think about what John said. He said he was rejected. He came to his own. He came to his own that received him not. But as to many as received him, to them it gave him power to become the sons of God. Before he said that earlier on the verse, he said that, that the Son of God, word, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. He said, we beheld, we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. Oh, it, all, it all summed up in that tonight. If we can, if we can beheld or behold Jesus anew and afresh, we will have beheld the glory of God. Hallelujah. Now, let's just sing it once or twice, Brother Shroud, and then we'll have a closing prayer. Praise the Lord.
more appropriately than Moses said it, we say it with him tonight. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Help us to be sensitive enough to God to know what it is that's in the way. And help us to get it moved out of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.